Okay. Before we move on, we're going to go into uh, some greater detail, into some different barrel configurations and contours, and uh, kind of examine how these different profiles affect barrel rigidity. After uh, posting the video on vi uh, rifle vibrations and harmonics, I got some really good questions on how fluting and like uh, some of the triangular barrel designs affect rigidity. So this is uh, this is definitely worth addressing. So we're going to do another quick video here and get some of the common misconceptions of fluting and of other uh, barrel profiles straightened out here. And uh, then we'll be able to move on to the rest of our equipment selection. So let's start by taking a, uh, a look at some of the different barrel profiles here. These are uh, cross-section illustrations that I made on uh, paint the other day of some of the different common barrel profiles you might see. And as we talked about before on the, the barrel harmonics video, uh, increasing rigidity of the rifle system, not just the barrel, but the entire system, does reduce the amplitude of the, uh, the anti-node regions of the vibrations. So if you increase rigidity of the system, it'll have less deflection le back and forth as the rifle vibrates, which uh, increases the inherent precision uh, capabilities of the rifle. And as we said before also, uh, particularly in barrel profiles, generally speaking, the shorter and fatter a barrel is, the more rigid it is. And I realize that's a common sense deal, but here's the, uh, the engineering math behind all that. Basically, it comes down to the moment of inertia which uh, the primary uh, factor in that is the radius of your barrel. The greater the radius, the greater your moment of inertia, which is kind of the engineering way of uh, uh, quantifying rigidity. And then you can plug that moment of inertia into your uh, formula and calculate your maximum deflection at the free end of a rifle barrel that is possible, you know, under different load conditions. Uh, we don't want to get into too much calculus today, but uh, basically your moment of inertia has to do with the the radius. So here's a set of pictures of a few different uh, barrel profiles we're going to cover here. And uh, in column A, you'll see the beginning part of the barrel. This is just a, a standard bull barrel on A1. And then uh, in uh, column B, you see in the red, that's where we're going to remove some material and uh, basically do the cuts for uh, fluting it. And then in C and D, you'll see at the end, uh, column D, you'll have your fluted barrel. So you'll be removing material from uh, the really heavy bow barrel in column A until you get over to column D, and that's the end, end product there. In row number two, you'll see a triangular barrel design. And in uh, row number three, we'll talk briefly about octagonal barrel designs. And there's there's more contours than that, but those are the, the real common ones that are you know, different than just a standard round barrel. So let's see what we got going on here. First, let's talk about uh, fluting. Now, if you go on down to the local gun store and ask the guy behind the counter about barrel fluting, he might tell you that uh, a fluted barrel will be more rigid than a round barrel. And uh, that kind of depends on the overall uh, radius of the barrels, I guess. But let's see, let's see how this works. It's actually quite simple. And uh, what you may have heard in the past may not be correct. There's a lot of misconceptions about how this fluting works. So uh, here's a picture of some different fluting possibilities. We got uh, three rows and four columns. So let's start off with row number one. We're going to start off with a really heavy barrel contour, a real fat bowl barrel that's round, okay? Then we're going to remove material, as shown by the re uh, red in column B. So that's what we're going to cut off. We're going to machine that off. We're going to remove steel from the bull barrel. And then after we remove the steel, we will have the outside diameter, uh, including the outside of the flutes, will be uh, the same diameter as the original bull barrel, but you'll see how the flutes cut into, so you have a new inner diameter on the inside of the flutes. So what we've done is we've, we have reduced the weight of the barrel because your cross-sectional area of your barrel is less. So we have reduced the rate. Another thing that has been increased is the overall surface area. And uh, there's some misconceptions about how surface area plays in with cooling as well, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. So the basic rule of thumb here to understand is that anytime 
You remove material from any kind of piece of steel, you reduce the strength of it, or you could call it rigidity. So anytime you remove material, you actually reduce the rigidity. Now, some people might kind of think they, because they've heard in the past that, well, you know, like uh, sometimes cylinders like arranged in a certain fashion or you drill holes in steel. Why do engineers do things like that? Why do they put triangles in things and change the shapes of things? Well, that's more having to do with the efficiency of design. If they have a limited amount of weight they can have and they have a load bearing uh, that they have to uh, compensate for, like in, in one plane of direction, like if you're going to Gravity is always pulling down, for example. So an I-beam, you can distribute the material vertically. And so your rigidity is only going to be distributed vertically in an I-beam. So an I-beam can more efficiently uh, put the metal where it needs to be in order to support that load. That load. Now, rifle barrels, is that's not an I-beam. And we're not talking about a force of gravity or load bearing. Rifle barrels are going to be vibrating 360 degrees across the cross section. They're going to go in in every direction. So in a rifle bear, you're going to need uh, what what some would call load bearing capacity from every direction in all 360 degrees because it's not just going to be up and down. It could be left and right, or you know, 45 degrees, or in everywhere in between. Typical rifle barrel is going to be vibrating in every direction. So let's look at uh, row number two. Now we have the uh, fluted barrel that we uh, ended up with on uh, row number one, column D. We're going to take that barrel and drop it down to column two. Now we're going to remove material from the flutes. Okay, so we're going to cut those flutes off. Uh, you'll see that in uh, row number two, column B. The red, the flutes are being cut off. We're grinding those off, and we're making it into a round barrel again. So now we've removed material from a fluted barrel and made it round. Anytime you remove material, the rigidity goes down. Your strength goes down of your, of your uh, entire structure. So in this case, the uh, option of the barrel that's a round barrel in column D, where we removed material to get that round barrel, that's going to be less rigid than the fluted barrel we started with in uh, column A. So the question, uh, what's more rigid, a fluted barrel or a round barrel, totally hinges on the overall amount of material that we have. Like we said before, uh, as shown in column or uh, row number one, we removed material from the round barrel and made their, made the fluted barrel, which has less material. That's In that case, the fatter bull barrel is definitely going to have more material. All those spots where you remove material, you're removing strength there. Likewise, in uh, row number two, where we start off with a uh, fluted barrel and we grind the flutes off, removing material... And that's going to be even less rigid than it was before, even though it's round. So it's, uh, you can't really ask, like, you can't know just by if it's fluted around. You have to know the radius. You have to know the diameter, the overall cross-section of, of the barrel. How big is it? How much material is there? That's going to answer your question. Uh, now, uh, row number three is a kind of a hypothetical deal. And we're going to, if there was some way you could add material to a fluted barrel, so we were starting off with the fluted barrel, and let's say there was some way, it would be an engineering nightmare to try to do this, but you fill those flutes back in with steel, and it bonds perfectly and everything, okay? Now, that's not really uh, something you're going to ever accomplish very well, but let's just say, theoretically, if you added steel in those, where the steel had been removed, removed into those flutes, and you end up with a bull barrel again, that's more material, you're adding material, so you add rigidity to the system. So that's basically how it works. That's the rule of thumb. Uh, more material, more rigidity. Less material, less rigidity. And, of course, it, it does depend on how it's distributed. I mean, there could be some really stupid ways that a guy could distribute your material. Um, but basically, that's how it works. So let's look at this uh, next chart here. And this is showing triangular barrel, barrel designs. And on the bottom, we do have an octagonal barrel. But first, let's talk about triangular design. So uh, in column A here, we're looking at a, a round bull barrel, and we're going to remove some material. See those red? That's where we're going to cut off the, the steel, and we're going to end up with a triangular barrel design. Again, we're removing steel. Anytime you remove steel, you remove all that support and strength that that extra steel had, and you have a less rigid barrel. 
Now let's say we have that triangular barrel as shown in row number two. So now we're starting off with the triangular barrel. And now we're gonna remove more material to make it round. So we'll see that red line, that circle. We're gonna grind everything off when we're gonna we're put it in the lathe and we're gonna grind it back down to a round barrel. Now it's even less rigid than, than we started because again, you're removing more material even yet. So it's really quite simple how it works. It doesn't really have to do so much with shape. Shape do, does affect it, but it's the overall amount of uh, steel you have in the cross section, which is gonna determine that. And you can do calculus on this stuff to, to figure it out uh, in an engineering way to give you exact values on rigidity, but that's generally how it works. We're gonna try to keep it kind of simple. Same thing with the octagonal design here. Uh, we start off with a bull barrel and uh, we're gonna shave off the sides and we're gonna cut that into an octagon. Now we've removed material. So it's, uh, now in the case of this octagonal barrel, we didn't remove a whole lot, so it's still gonna be pretty rigid. But the main original motivation for removing material in the first place was weight. Obviously you remove material and you reduce the weight. And that was the prime motivation for that. Uh, so sometimes you might want a little bit, you want more rigidity than a skinny barrel but you don't want the weight of a bull barrel. So you kind of want a medium in there and you're not gonna have as much rigidity as you did as if you just had that original bull barrel, but you, it might just be too heavy. So some people use some of these, uh, these old ways of reducing the weight by shaving off some of the metal in places which don't compromise as much rigidity, rigidity as if they just totally uh, turned it down to a skinny barrel. So let's do some practice here. Here's a chart of the basic different contours that we talked about, and let's try to arrange these in order of rigidity. And actually, they already are arranged, it looks like. So uh, obviously over here in column A, you have the heavy, heavy bull barrel. That's got the most material, and that's gonna be the most rigid. It, it's also gonna be the most heavy, but it's gonna give you the most rigidity. Uh, we can remove a little bit of material from that, to reduce weight, but we still keep a lot of the overall rigidity. Now, if you wanted to find out the exact equivalent of rigidity that this particular fluted barrel would have in comparison to, uh, like if you wanted to make an equation, uh, equating that with some sort of a diameter round barrel, like what equivalent round barrel would this fluted barrel be equivalent to in rigidity, you'd have to do some calculus. And uh, I can show you the formula here again. And that's just part of the formula. That's just for the overall radius. You'd have to do a lot more steps. And in, you'd have to probably have an engineering program on your computer to figure out exactly the rigidity value there. But anytime you remove material, you lower the rigidity. Okay, and then in column C, that's a lighter barrel. Now, in this case, this round barrel has a, a smaller diameter. It, it's actually the same dimensions as the inside diameter of those flutes on uh, column B, the fluted barrel. So basically they just ground the flutes off and so that round barrel will have less rigidity than that particular fluted barrel. Now again, it would be hard to uh, increase rigidity by adding flutes because that's not how they do that. When you get a barrel fluted, you take in a barrel and remove material, that's how it works. And likewise with the triangular barrel here in uh, column D, what we have is uh, we, it's the same original dimensions as the uh, round barrel in C, We've cut those uh, three sides off and now we have even more weight removed and we have kept some of the rigidity because you have those triangular uh, portions sticking out which does uh, retain some of the rigidity and uh, while you still remove some weight. Uh, and you'll notice here below we have the octagonal barrel. Now these are both uh, made from the same diameter here in this case. So in order to compare, well, which one's more rigid, the uh, octagonal barrel or the triangular barrel? There again, you'd have to do probably an engineering program and put in this exact dimensions. And I didn't write any, I just drew these, sketched them out. So uh, you'd have to measure that and find out exactly your cross-sectional area and then plug all that information into an engineering program. But they'd be pretty, they'd be pretty similar as far as rigidity, rigidity is concerned. And then in uh, column E, we'd take one of those two barrels, like the triangular barrel or the uh, octagonal barrel, and we'd continue to remove material until we've got a uh, skinny contour hunting style barrel again. And that is gonna have the least overall rigidity of all these in this graph. So more material, more rigid. Pretty simple how that works. Yes, you could find some fluted barrels that would be more rigid, 
than some round barrels, but those are going to be round barrels that are skinnier than the fluted barrels. And so that's just a matter of how much uh, material you have there. So if you want maximum rigidity in your rifle and you've got your stock channel already carved out, I mean, you're going to have that stock channel carved. See, so that's the amount of space you have to fill. You want to fill that with the maximum amount of metal you can. Unless you have weight criteria that if you need to remove weight because you're going to be carrying this rifle or something, uh, you, it's going to be a sacrifice of rigidity to redu reduce your weight in that case. So anytime you flute a barrel, you reduce the rigidity of it. So how does fluting affect the cooling dynamics of a rifle barrel? Well, first we got to figure out what produces the heat in a rifle barrel. Where does it originate? Where is it distributed? And then what happens to that heat once it's uh, in the barrel? Uh, so to understand how fluting uh, is related to the cooling dynamics, we need to first figure this out. Now, one of the principles of thermodynamics you want to be familiar with is the first law of thermodynamics, and that's Basically, in a nutshell, you've heard this said probably in high school, although they redefined it uh, in more clear terms, energy cannot be created or destroyed. Now, the total energy of an isolated system is constant. So energy can be transformed from one form to another, but it can't be created or destroyed. And so if you think about this in the context of uh, a rifle barrel getting heated up, uh, the, the energy exists in the, the chemical bonds and the propellants in the, in the gunpowder that's sitting in your cartridge. And uh, that energy is converted from that potential chemical energy into, you know, heat, kinetic energy of the bullet flying down the bore and so forth. And there's a whole list of steps that you could follow. And uh, there's a lot of little things going on in detail that you can track. But uh, that energy is converted. And uh, there are a few main things that end up really causing the barrel to actually heat up. So you have the conversion of this potential energy in the chemical bonds, and you get all these hot gases. That's one thing that's probably the most obvious thing that people think about is, you know, you got fire going down the bore. So obviously that's going to cause something to heat up. And then you have the friction, right? Uh, you have a loss of kinetic energy in, in the form of friction as the bullets sliding through the rifling. And uh, that's going to be transferred over into heat energy as well. So that's another source of heat energy. But there's another thing that a lot of folks don't think about, and that's the compression wave that occurs that goes through the matrix of the steel. And uh, most people kind of have a general misconception uh, that a rifle barrel is primarily heated up by only the hot gases or the friction of that bullet traveling down the bore. Now, although that is true, they do definitely contribute to the heat. Uh, there's a big chunk of that heat that your rifle barrel experiences is generated in the metal of the barrel itself as the compression wave uh, causes that metal to kind of flex, okay? Um, so basically, as these molecules are compressed at a high rate, you're going to have heating. Any material that's compressed rapidly basically heats up. Uh, if you just take a bar of metal and you bend it back and forth, you're going to experience quite a lot of heat. You can actually burn stuff if you do that enough. And uh, this compression wave is it's rapidly expanding gases generating in the bore. They exert an equal pressure on the metal of the barrel. And it's actually this compression wave that causes the metal to heat itself with the really, really hot temperatures. And it's going to actually distribute it the heat nearest to the bore because that's where you're going to have the highest differential pressure. So the farther you get from the bore, you're going to have a smaller differential pressure and therefore you're going to have less heat generated due to the compression wave. And also obviously the friction and hot gases are going to be generated right in the bore as well in the center of the barrel where the bullets rubbing through and where the hot gases are. So that's where your heat is primarily generated in the bore. Okay. Now, what happens to this heat energy once it's transferred into the steel of your rifle barrel? Well, that's where another thing comes into mind here. Uh, that's where we look at the second law of thermodynamics. And that basically states that uh, the entropy of an isolated system never decreases because the isolated system spontaneously evolved towards thermodynamic equilibrium. What that basically means is that uh, within a chunk of steel a closed system or a semi-isolated system, uh, you're going to have that heat trying to disperse itself evenly within that chunk of steel. 
So it's, it's going for a thermodynamic equilibrium. Now, once that piece of steel is at relative thermodynamic equilibrium, it's going to want to continue in its quest to have more equilibrium, and then it's going to try to come off of the steel and go out into the air. So at the instant that heat is transferred into the uh, inner layers of the steel matrix in the bore, you're going to have conduction occurring. And that's uh, conduction is just heat transfer by means of molecular agitation within a material without any motion of the material as a whole. So if one end of a steel barrel is at higher temperature than the other end, the energy is going to be transferred down that barrel towards the colder side because uh, the higher speed particles are going to collide with the slower ones and there's going to be a net transfer of energy towards the slower ones. So that's the conduction. So as the heat's generated towards the center of the bore through the compression wave and the friction and the, the, the hot gas is expanding, you're going to have that uh, the steel, the chunk of steel that your barrel is made out of, is going to try to reach that uh, thermodynamic equilibrium. And uh, so it's, that's going to be through the means of conduction. Now that's going to occur uh, relatively quickly, okay? Now, once your uh, barrel has reached its uh, thermodynamic equilibrium, it's now going to try to get rid of that heat and achieve even further equilibrium with the, uh, a larger system, but it's going to want to spread that heat energy evenly throughout the air, too. So then you're going to have convection occurring. Convection is just the heat transfer by mass motion of a fluid such as air or water when the, when the heated fluid is caused to move away from the heat source carrying the heat energy with it so you have two different means of a uh, heat transfer going on here that are uh, trying to help along the second law of thermodynamics to, to reach thermodynamic equilibrium okay so there's two ways you can help protect your rifle bore in its most susceptible areas the the bore and we're going to get into this in more detail later on but you're going to experience thermal erosion mechanisms that are going to uh basically change the properties of the steel in your rifle bore, particularly in the, the most vulnerable regions, such as the throat region, and it's going to embrittle the steel, which is going to cause it to be more susceptible to erosion by chemical means and by mechanical means. Uh, so when you're cleaning your rifle bore, when you're shooting bullets down, down the barrel, uh, it's really this heat shock of the steel which is going to weaken it. So you're, you are going to want to try to minimize thermal shock and the heat damage to the inside of your rifle bore. Uh, and there's a couple different ways of going about this. The, the number one goal is to get the heat away from the susceptible areas, which is the immediate surface of where the bullet is rubbing, obviously, because that's where your uh, rifling is going to have its bearing on, on the bullet. That's where it's going to grab it. You want those corners to stay nice and sharp, and you don't want it to be changing or getting embrittled. So you're going to want to remove the heat from the bore, which is the critical part. That's the whole point of the barrel. And you're going to want to either evenly distribute that through the steel uh, to where it's not all concentrated at the bore or at the throat region, the vulnerable areas, or you're going to want to just get rid of it. And actually, both things are going to happen at the same time. Um, one thing you can do to remediate, to remediate these different heat issues is you can simply increase the mass of the steel that you're using in your barrel. This is kind of a heat sink effect. So when you think about conduction of the heat within the rifle barrel, uh, you're going to be generating a certain amount of uh, units of this thermal energy. Now, if you have a 900-pound uh, piece of steel versus a 1-pound piece of steel, and you add the same amount of thermal energy to the 900-pound piece as you do to the 1-pound piece, you're obviously going to have that heat distributed much more widely within the huge massive chunk, right? Because uh, there's a lot more metal for that heat to hide in. So the heat at any one given area is going to be less than the heat energy. Okay. Now with a small piece, you add the same amount of energy as you did to the lar large piece, and you're going to have uh, more heat per unit area, right? Or per mass volume. And uh, that's kind of one of the things that happens here is the heat sink. So the uh, heavy barrel is going to distribute that heat more uh, widely. It's, it's going to have more heat spread out. So you're going to have uh, less concentration of heat at those vulnerable areas. So that's one of the reasons why if you take two rifle barrels, a real, real heavy bull barrel, well, a lot of guys even use just a barrel blank, which is just a real heavy barrel, 
And um, if you take one of those and you shoot it next to a lightweight barrel, like a, a hunting profile barrel, and you shoot 10 rounds through it, the same exact caliber and everything, uh, same load, at the and you do it at the same rate of fire, you're going to notice when you grab on the barrel immediately after the shooting test, that the really heavy barrel is going to feel a lot cooler to the touch than the small one. Well, you have the same amount of heat transfer into each barrel, but the heavier barrel was a larger heat sink, and it could more evenly distribute that heat within the barrel. So that's one way of dealing with this issue, is you can just spread that heat out within the matrix of the steel by having a heavier barrel. Now, that being the case, that would cause a guy to think, okay, uh, well, then flutes would not be advantageous because that's removing material from the barrel. And uh, if you remove material, you're going to have less of a heat sink. Okay. Well, if you look at it from the other way, fluting does increase the surface area of the barrel. Uh, you know, if you're just looking at a perfectly round barrel versus one with flutes cut into it, you're going to have more surface area, obviously. And uh, it's really that surface area, which is going to be the primary means of getting that heat transferred off of the barrel completely through the means of convection that we talked about a second ago. Um, however, steel has a very, very high coefficient of thermal conductivity. And air has a very low coefficient of thermal conductivity. What that basically means is that the temperature of the steel is going to become homogeneous long before any significant heat transfer uh, occurs into the air. So when we consider that fact, um, the amount of heat you can actually remove from a rifle barrel quickly is going to be somewhat limited by just the properties of how uh, the heat is going to be transferred from the steel to the air. So increasing your surface area will help this out. If you look at an engine, like here's my uh, 2110 uh, CC stroker that's out of my Volkswagen Beetle here, and it has cooling fins. That's why engines like that have cooling fins. That dramatically increases the surface area. And if you look at how big those fins are on that engine, or if you look at a motorcycle engine, you got the same deal going on, you have a huge increase in surface area um, on that, that piece of metal. And that's trying to get that... Uh, you know, it's an air-cooled engine, but that's also, you got to think about it. The air-cooled engine is also an active means of uh, heat removal. And you have a fan channeling air through there trying to remove that heat quickly. On a rifle barrel, you're most likely not going to have a radiator or a fan or a tin on the outside of the barrel directing the airflow to remove that heat. So... Uh, inc increasing the surface area to remove any significant amount of heat is going to be more difficult in a conventional barrel design than it is going to be in a, a system where you have active heat removal, such as a water-cooled machine gun is an example of a firearm that did utilize that, or as a air-cooled Volkswagen engine. Uh, a precision rifle, you're not going to want to have all that junk strapped on there. That's going to be that's going to negatively affect your harmonics. And that's not going to be conducive to the most accuracy that you could have gotten out of there. So for our purposes is the question, is fluting worth the extra money for sake of barrel cooling? So is the fluting going to help? Well, although it does increase the surface area of the bore, that's undeniable. There will be a uh, increase of convection potential that could occur on that barrel. However, it is still going to be limited because the flutes can only be so deep. You're not going to have anywhere near a cooling fin going on on a precision rifle barrel. And even if you did, it wasn't an active form of heat transfer, okay, or an active form of uh, heat removal. You're not blowing any air across it. So uh, you really need air movement to really get that to work the best. And another thing you need to notice, too, is here that your flutes are going to be located in the areas of the barrel which are the least susceptible to damage. You've got to consider your areas most susceptible to damage are the throat, which is located right in front of the chamber, and that's back uh, where the barrel is still pretty thick, where it's uh, screwed into the action. And so when you have a barrel fluted, that's, the flutes don't even start until quite a ways, a couple inches in front of the uh, throat region usually. And depending on the taper of the barrel, um, 
that that could be a, a little bit different. Even though con- conduction does transfer that energy relatively quickly, you would want the flutes in a, preferably to be within general proximity of the area you're trying to protect. The flutes are not going to be located within proximity to the throat region. Now, it is, if you look at the throat region where that would be in a rifle barrel, that is thicker, so it already kind of does have a larger surface area back there anyways. So adding flutes in front of that is not really going to help you out in that vulnerable area. Okay, so all things being said and done here, this is really a matter of personal preference. If someone uh, feels compelled to get their barrel fluted, I wouldn't make fun of them because it does... It does increase the surface area, and that will help out your convection, and that will uh, decrease the measured amount of heat at the throat region even because you are going to have that conduction. So it will help in barrel cooling. However, I don't think that it's going to have a significant enough heat removal advantage to justify the loss in rigidity or the loss in weight, which actually... On a lot of long-range precision applications, weight is your friend, like we discussed before. A heavy barrel is actually going to be very, very good for absorbing a lot of recoil. And if you're laying down all day with the rifles, uh, weight can be your friend. So with those things in mind, uh, I do not recommend getting a barrel fluted for long-range precision applications. However, if uh, weight, if reduced weight is a criteria, if this is a rifle you're going to want to transport more and you still do want to retain some of the uh, rigidity of the original diameter of the barrel without uh, having too much weight, then fluting might be an option. Or for purposes of uh, a target shooter or a varmint shooter who's going to be doing a very, very uh, high volume of fire in a short amount of time, if your pace of fire is quick, you are going to want a little bit of an edge possibly on your uh, surface area. So anything that can help remove that heat through convection will be... uh, welcomed and so if you're a, a, a varmint shooter is going to lay down and shoot off 800 rounds in one day on a hot summer day maybe uh you know that extra surface area will give you peace of mind but i i don't think for the most purposes of long range precision shooting you're not going to be laying down and shooting that many rounds you're gonna it's going to be a one shot and move kind of deal you're gonna have plenty of time for your board to heat down for most applications in the real world so that's my commentary on barrel fluting. I do like fluted barrels. I do have a few. Uh, I think that it's pretty cool, and it uh, it does remove some weight, and it does retain uh, some of the rigidity. It will be less rigid anytime you remove material, but it does retain some of that rigidity. So it is a, a pretty good way to go. If you have two barrels of equal weight, uh, one of them with a larger outside diameter with flutes and the other one with a smaller outside diameter without flutes, the fluted barrel in that case will actually have more rigidity. Uh, so if the if the weight is the primary criteria, then fluting is is kind of a good way to go. But uh, if maximum rigidity is your criteria, then that's gonna probably cause you to just want to have an unfluted heavy barrel. On your triangular design, you're actually gonna have less surface area. If you let's say you have the uh, the round barrel and you cut off. The, the sides there so you can get the triangular design now instead of having that whole arc of circumference you're going to have just a straight line so you actually reduce your surface area and likewise with the octagonal on in a lesser degree so if you uh if weight is uh, one of your mission parameters where you got to keep your weight down but you still do want some of the rigidity you would have had in that out, large outer diameter then fluting is a is a good idea other than that, uh, if you're looking for maximum rigidity, like for a target rifle or a dedicated long-range rifle that, you know, it's going to be pretty heavy anyways. Uh, so if, if weight isn't really a concern for you, like uh, my big rifle is pretty heavy. It's almost 20 pounds. So, uh, but it's just got a standard heavy barrel configuration. It's got the just a round bull barrel. And that's that's your round heavy bull barrels with your largest diameters are going to have the maximum rigidity. Okay, so I hope this kind of helped to straighten it out. That was pretty brief. We didn't go into too much detail into the math for you, but like I said before, you can uh, double check this with engineers. You can uh, you know research this yourself a little bit, and you can look up the formulas online to uh, find out the exact values. 
But like we said on the video before on uh, rifle vibrations and harmonics, although you can reduce your uh, your amplitude of your anti-node regions, and that's the, the regions of the maximum vibration along the length of a, of a solid vibrating object, if you want to cut down how far, for example, your rifle barrel is uh, vibrating, the actual distance, you want to increase rigidity. So I would recommend a bull barrel for that. However, you don't necessarily need to increase rigidity to get good performance out of your rifle system. You can, uh, you can harmonically tune your rifle, like we said before in the video, uh, with barrel tensioning devices and things like this to control where the node region is or to move the node region of the vibrations where there's no vibrations. Because uh, if you have a standing wave, like we said before, uh, you can manipulate the uh, vibration the vibration patterns of your rifle to move that node region closer to the end of the muzzle. And that will pretty much have even more of an effect than just increasing overall rigidity sometimes. So you can get a real skinny barrel with hardly any rigidity at all compared to one of these bull barrels, like way less rigidity to actually shoot just as good as one of these bull barrels. If you uh, have mastered how to do your harmonic tuning. And like we said before, that's through load development or by other barrel tensioning devices or things like this, or uh, experimenting with bedding. And uh, so hopefully this video gave you a good idea and uh, got some of those questions answered for you. Eight nine zero, confirm. Oh, you got it! Oh. Holy cow, you got yeah. it! Indexing 20.36. 20. 20. Point, we're going 20.4.
good call. 